My name is Adrian Potter. I grew up in Vermont, in Melbourne, which is a leafy green, not so wealthy outer suburb. A lot of creeks to play in, a lot of forest as well. When I was growing up, it's not there now. It's all gone. Always mucking around with my hands, building things, building billy carts. I must have built a million of those, and um, all sorts of other stuff besides. Always put my bike to bits every week, but <laughs> rebuilt it. This is what I did. I just loved doing that sort of stuff. I went to Vermont Primary School and then Vermont High School. I think the subject I was most interested in was girls. And apart from that, I did um, the th uh, two maths and three sciences, or whatever it was, two sciences, three, two maths, and English, which I was crap at. And uh, then went on to university, Melbourne University, studying mechanical engineering. I found university really amazing. Like That was just fantastic liberating, beautiful thing to do, particularly at that time, sort of the end of the, just before Hex came in, so it was, it was just fantastic. I loved it, loved the university life, but mm. I have nightmares still of maths exams, which, because you know, in engineering you do four years of mathematics, you can imagine how tricky it gets, and even like Within the last month, I would have had a nightmare about missing an exam in mathematics at university, not not having done any work like I did because I was hopeless. So I went to work for three years in a windscreen wiper manufacturer called Trico, and they're in Melbourne. At least they were until about oh, I don't know ten years ago when they, like everyone else, up ship and moved to China to do their manufacturing. But Trico did and probably still does do the all the windscreen wipers arms and linkages for all of the Australian manufacturers of cars and most of the American ones and most of the British ones too. Um, at least they did but the last time I looked Trico windscreen wipers were pretty hard to find so I don't know. It was an okay job but it was incredibly boring and I was an imposter there. So they employed somebody, which was me, to just check the stress analysis of these particular parts. So that was my only job and all I was required to do was just do this on this particular program and the computers way back then were woefully slow. So it took, well, it took about two months to do something um, that would now take, you know, a day just in computing speed. You can't do it by hand. I mean, you could, but the mathematics is way too complicated. So that's what the computer was for. And anyway, so that, that's what I did. And then did a lot of testing. So, you know, windscreen wipers going around the clock for a couple of months, verifying that the winds, you know, it was basically certification for the manufacturer. And then did a bit of high speed testing around racetracks and stuff, which I couldn't stand. It was frightening as. And uh, what else? So at the end though, when I was already going to leave that job, I was doing um, industrial engineering, so getting things made on the factory floor and I really liked that, like having a leading hand. I was working with a leading hand, a couple of tool makers and um, to a lesser extent the, the process workers too, but basically the leading hand was running them. So. And I just found that was just great fun, like getting things made and getting that process made too. I'm drawn to making things. Mm. I went to study visual arts, majoring in wood at the ANU in Canberra. And I did that because I was much more interested in design and craft than I was in the job that I was doing. In fact, the yeah, the job I was doing was soul destroying. It was a great job, but it wasn't for me. And um, I'd got into craft and wood in particular uh, via music. So always played guitar. Then because I make things, I made guitars and I pulled other guitars apart. And um, so I was interested in the wood aspect, and I was collecting wood for the guitars which I was making, which I still play, as a matter of fact. And then I read this book by a guy called James Krenov, who was a Swedish, American, Russian. And um, it was a book called A Cabinet Maker's Notebook. 
and I was completely captivated. And I'm not the only one in the world. Like he completely changed the lives of a lot of people that I've met. He had um, the tradition of the craft and had the lifestyle of a designer maker in their studio, pottering away, you know, making making art or you know being spiritual about it a little bit. And yeah, that's that's why I went. That's why I got interested in furniture and wood from that and the craft aspect too. Now, I, I do know from people that have met and studied with James Cranoff that it was all a bit of a, a bit of hocus pocus. It wasn't really the real deal, which I kind of get and I think that's okay too. And actually having been a professional designer maker for almost 20 years, I, I completely get where he was coming from and how he could manufacture a manufacture a, um, a lifestyle out of it and it's it, it it's just you can't it's a it's a shimmer it's a myth <laughs> but it's a beautiful myth and it certainly changed my life loved it the head of the workshop was a guy called George Ingham who subsequently became a mentor for me and um, invited me back m many times to teach um, students which I've terribly honoured by him. And he was um, in every way the real deal. Where James Crenov, I was talking before about inventing a myth, uh, George also had a lot of myth associated with him but actually he was much more the real thing in designing and making it at the most amazing level. And as an individual, as a human being, an incredible man. And um, I, unfortunately, no longer with us, so I miss him terribly. But uh, he was um, he was a great influence in, in in my life as well as my craft. Well, the yeah. university was all guitars, so I was only interested in guitars and music. And furniture only only arrived when I'd left home. Two year course, full time, and it only majored in the wood workshop, so that was the only workshop I was in. It was all hands-on and daily classes weren't, the, well, there was no daily classes, it was like a daily workshop. In fact, it was, you know, I would get there at nine o'clock and leave at 9 p.m. and um, we had projects and we'd have, well, at the start we were taught skills, but in the second year it was mainly self-directed so we were given a project at the start of term and had eight makes to make a design and make a chair and that was what we did and if we had trouble we went and asked and it's a brilliant brilliant way to do it instead of had no lectures none but if there was demonst there was a lot of demonstrations of various techniques and certainly the if if there was any help needed it was available. George was an incredibly knowledgeable man, not correct all the time but for the most part pretty much on the money and always striving for excellence. Techniques, well standard techniques of um, cutting and um, surfacing, so making things flat, getting them joined properly We learnt notions of aesthetics, notions of design, and uh, it was done in a very practical way, as I've said. So it was all like, have a go at something, trying to get an outcome, but also watch your fellow students also having a go at that same project or different projects if they're in a different stream, different year level, uh, and learn from them as well. Fantastic way to do it. I moved to Adelaide to join the jam factory, which was in the furniture uh, furniture studio workshop, whatever it was. Uh, associate designer that went for two years, and then subsequently I did two years rented a studio at the jam factory. We did we did a bit of commercial work. We did um, seventy chairs for a restaurant, 
20 tables, wine racks, things like that. We did, um, we investigated production aspects in furniture. And um, I've got a claim to fame. In fact, I've got two claims to fame. I was the first furniture associate to sell my products into the wholesale department at the jam factory. And I was the first person to sell more than $5,000 worth of product in a year at the jam factory. And I think I was the first associate to have their products endorsed by the jam factories as a sort of, um, of my personal product was the jam factories thing. And that would have all been finished up in 98. And then I've been renting studio and well currently for the last 10 years, easily 10 years, I've got a studio in the backyard and that's where I've been working from. A design process would be to firstly ensure that I'm going to get paid and once the payment is there I'll start doing the research and the research would take into account the architecture of the building, the the architect of the building, whether or not um, uh, the particular priest is interested in traditional sort of styles or are they interested in contemporary styles or what's their aesthetic and quite often they don't have one actually they're very um, cerebral people in my experience. Not all of them but uh, at least the ones I've dealt with very much about communication and people rather than built objects. Mm. Mm. And what I find is that because the architecture of the churches is, is always quite strong, so we're talking about ecclesiastical furniture here as opposed to somebody's house um, or a commercial design fit out activity, the architecture is always prominent and it's all in my experience and the jobs that I've done already there so I've just built on the architecture you know turn things upside down so that the a vaulted ceiling is now turned upside down and made into a volume which is then the top so do you yeah. how, do I, how do I explain that for the for the recording it's um as if you've turned the roof upside down, poured water in it, and then made it turn into ice, and that's the altar. Yeah, and then put legs on it, say. So that sort of thing, or um, using the shapes of, of the, the building behind the altar, for instance. The altar's the most important part, in terms of the Catholic Church at any rate, which is the people that I've been building for. And I'm not so interested in placing my own aesthetic into those activities. I'm much more interested in reinforcing the meaning that that particular parish wants to, uh, how that parish wants to celebrate the sacrament. And if I can do that, then that'll make me happy. It's my own church is, is not so concerned about the rights or wrongs of having newness necessarily. It's more more interested in in telling a story and um, the things that I make for myself as opposed to commissions which are my bread and butter. Although not so much lately but in the past they have been. Um, I'm more interested in telling the story of for instance water in Australia or tattoos, graffiti, and uh, those stories I think um, personally much more exciting than being concerned with making something new or not. The idea, the concept of it come, comes first, came first in this. I was going to make a piece of furniture which was which had the human form on it and it was going to be the river tattoo kind of reflects the water series as well so there's kind of a doubling up there which I quite like and um, the Japanese tattoos which were really quite typical of the koi 
there's a whole lot of other symbols as well, particularly the dragon, which um, I started out, that was the first thing I was going to do was a dragon that was going to wrap the whole cabinet. Um, and why I didn't make a dragon, why I went to Koi, I don't know, but Koi it was from a pretty early stage and the dragon piece is still yet to be made. And it had to be black, consequently it's ebony and the black represents the ink. Now there's another reason for the ebony choice and that's because I need to sell it, like I'm in it for the, I need to make a living and what I've found is that my clients, particularly with speculative pieces, are more inclined to buy timbers that have meaning and ebony has meaning all over it. It's very rich, it's rare, and it's known to be rich and rare. So um, I would hope that I'd have an easier sale with an ebony chest than I would with, say, a blackwood chest. Hue and Pine's another timber that I use a lot for that same reason. It's got cachet, it has meaning in and of itself that the buyer can then use to to help them on the way towards making that decision. So I had, I've got two things going on there. I've got the ink, which it's a no-brainer with the ink, and the economics of it, so it's ebony. Um, pretty hard material to get hold of. I imported it from the United States. I bought it on eBay and uh, got it into the country. So once I got the ebony in, I started making the carcass, which is the structural shell of it. So veneering, the, um, the plywood, and then making the carcass with the veneered plywood and then starting to build up the drawers and so the veneered carcass is then the draw runners are put into it and then once the draw runners are put into it I'll start to build the drawers and the drawers are made in such a way that they're also plywood normally traditionally drawers are made with solid timbers is the draw sides and they're dovetailed and the reason that they're dovetailed is because a dovetail joint doesn't it doesn't um, jam at an angle. How can I explain that? It does. It, it um, if you have a finger joint, the joint itself can twist into an angle, and hence the drawer itself can change shape. Whereas a dovetail, it has to be at 90 degrees, or at, at any rate, whatever um, angle that it was glued together at, uh, because of the wedging action of the dovetail. So that's the reason the dovetails exist. With plywood, you don't have, um, you, you could do dovetails in plywood, but because of the cross grain effect, it doesn't really, it's not, it's not the best option. There's other options available to you other than soft, other than the solid wood, which dovetails is the best option. Now it had to be plywood because I'm veneering and um, if you veneer onto solid wood with air conditioning and central heating, the dimensional change of the wood as it absorbs and gives off moisture over the year will cause the veneers to crack. So veneering onto plywood, plywood being an inert substrate, is the best way to go. So if the fronts are plywood, uh, we don't want to have the draw sides breaking away off the front, so they've got to be plywood too. So I start veneering the plywood for the internal of the drawer sides and the bottom of the drawer. You get the veneer, which um, you can either cut the veneers. I can either cut the veneers myself on a machine called a resaw, which is just a glorified bandsaw with a wide blade. Or you can buy the veneers uh, sliced commercially, which um, ordinarily they're half a millimetre sometimes a bit thicker than that but ordinarily half a millimetre thick and uh, it's a very economical use of the material. With this particular piece I make all the drawers internally before the fronts go on because those fronts need to be veneered very very precisely so that the grain runs down and 
the koi and not the flowers, but the central strip of untattooed flesh, so to speak, which is Tasmanian oak, that, um, that grain needs to run seemingly without um, a joint at each draw intersection. So the grain runs vertically on the raised human form and I think that I think that pretty much explains it. The decorations in there, so alright, so I've got my draw fronts and they're curved, which I laminate pieces of ply, thinner pieces of ply into a curve. Uh, the ply would be say three mil thick and I would use maybe five of those three mil thick sheets in a former, a curved former, male and female curved former, and when they're glued together they stay in that curve. And then I veneer, the decorative veneer on top of it, in this case it's ebony. I do that for all of the draw fronts, then the curved areas on the draw fronts, and then fit the draw fronts onto the drawers. So I haven't done any decoration yet, that comes after it's all, all that ground is in place. The decoration in this piece is uh, inlaid into that, as opposed to marquetry, which would be, um, all the veneers would be cut and assembled before the, the ground, as well as all the decorative, inla decorative veneers is glued on in one hit onto the um, surface. There's, so. There's two ways to do it. it. There's no really right or wrong way. It's like which one's going to be the quickest and easiest and will work best for this particular aspect. And I chose to inlay the um, the koi, the fish, because there's a lot of scales in the fish. So to cut them out individually is tricky because the pieces of timber are very fragile if they're thin in that scale. So I decided that I would inlay all of the decora decorations into the front of the cabinet and uh, so that I could use three millimeter thick veneers, which I cut myself and uh, cut on a scroll saw. And the way that the fish are made is there's, there's three colors. There's the, um, the yellow, the, sort of the silver ash, which is a yellow, light, very pale brown straw colour, and then there's silky oak, which is a golden mid-brown, and there's black. Well, the black is um, just a, um, a putty. And the way the two timbers for the fissure are made, it, they're stacked saw and I don't really know the right terminology for this but you set the scroll saw which is a very very fine jeweler's blade like a, a millimeter what in in depth and maybe 0.2 of a millimeter in thickness it cuts very very fine and the scroll saw um, is just a machine to get that saw blade moving up and down And I've got a beautiful old Delta scroll saw. It's a very old machine and it works marvelously. It's a very heavy machine. And if you tilt the table on the saw relative to the blade and then stick the silver ash and the silky oak on top of each other and then cut through at an angle, at a particular angle, when you have finished your cut, it just slides into itself so the one the bottom layer comes up into the wedge of the top layer and there no there's no gap it it just the, the, uh, it's like um telescoping um it's like a telescope or or a nesting cups mm -hmm. yeah so you've got a little angle on each cut and that angle allows those two pieces to to nest together and then once they're all nested together, you get rid of all the, the, the bits that you don't want uh, and keep the bits that you do want and glue them as you go. 
with super glue and then so that's the decorative element that then uh, so I had these decorative elements the fish which were all glued up pretty fragile but still they're in one piece and then you put that on top of the carcass where do I want them I found out where I want them and in what orientation I want them and then very very carefully with the scalpel I, I mark around it with the scalpel take the fish away then uh, remove the material where that fish is going to go. It's quite painstaking, but it's not particularly slow. You can do it quite fast. And in fact, the decoration on that piece is surprisingly fast. Like all of those, the decoration would have taken less than a week to do and then inlay. It's, it's a pretty quick sort of process. The design itself, that's another thing, but um, to actually do it, it's not, not too hard. And then, so once you've got the hole there, you just glue it in, a bit of pressure, and then cut it off. Really enjoy collaborations. I've collaborated many times with various people. And uh, it's always a great way to extend the boundaries of what I can do. And I certainly didn't know that Persia and Iran had any tradition at all in, in marketry or woodworking full stop in fact I knew nothing at all virtually about Iran apart from their political um, religious sort of notions and uh, I was very pleasantly surprised to find Shima and her husband Darush to be very funny and sophisticated people what we are making uh, is um, it's a kind of mandala although in Persia it wouldn't be a mandala it's, it's a design of a centre of a carpet that Shima had designed when she was studying, studying in Tehran now, I don't know how long ago this was but it must be say a decade ago or more and she designed a carpet, which, you know, Persian carpets, everyone sort of knows. So anyway, the, we, um, when we were considering what we would do together, we were meeting at my home. And it probably took a few meetings before we got down to doing her design for this carpet we had a few ideas that we were playing around with it was going to be a loom because it was a you know Persian carpets we were going to make a kind of a loom and then in the middle of that loom was going to be Persian motifs I think look I can't really remember but it wasn't it wasn't quite right and then Darush was Shima's husband was there he was he's very interested in the project too and he was he just said why don't Ashima you've got this design of your carpet that you've got and it's beautiful why don't you two do this and um, so that's how that came about that's how we started looking at her design for the carpet well her carpet is quite large and quite intricate and it wasn't going to be possible, like time-wise, for us to like make it out of um, inlaid timber, which is where we started from, or where we're at now, to do it in a pierced form. Um, so we've taken the centre of this carpet, which has a particular Persian name, which apparently loosely translated is the sun. That's the it's the central sort of roughly roundish motif in, in the carpet and it's kind of more or less a mandala in, in a western sort of um, sense. So we've taken this motif out of her carpet, we blew it up at the photocopier's double in size and have cut it out of timber, like I've pierced it out of timber which means that there's a lot of negative space. Negative space is like holes and then the uh, Persian motif um, is the is the solid timber that's left, and 
in addition to that, we've got a, a few elements that'll be uh, that'll go into the centre. Some of the the uh, main central element, including the very centre of, and that's inlaid timber, which Shima is going to paint, and perhaps uh, gold leaf as well. So um, I've done the woodworking aspect of it, and Shima is going to do the the far, further decorative aspect of it. I'm much more interested in just letting it go and and doing the best thing for the piece and the best thing that we can do for each other come up with something we couldn't have done ourselves which is what we've got I mean I can do piercing but I wouldn't have done this piercing I certainly wouldn't have used these motifs and they're beautiful motifs so it's like it's not so much a skills but a, like a, a kind of a decorative world opening up if Shima and I learn skills from each other um that's great. And certainly, there's like benefits that are intangible that are far outweigh anything. Like I, I don't really care if I learn a skill from Shima. I don't know if she's going to learn a skill from me. It's not about necessarily skills per se. It's kind of more of a cultural sharing. That's that's the way I see. It. Yeah.